Uh, well, greetings. It is a pleasure and honor to be here with all of you. And I had been expecting to say that, of course, we've been saving the best for last. But the truth is we all agreed in our pre-panel conversation that the student panel was the best. Oh, no. So no. just yeah. one more yeah. round of applause yeah. for students. I love the young man who said, when I was young, I thought about what I wanted to do. <laughs> okay, exactly. when you were young. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a real, real honor to be here today with Governor Bryant and Governor Wise and Lieutenant Governor Coleman for this panel on how to be an education governor such an important subject and such a present subject. So we are really going to talk about the present moment and the future we're all trying to get to. Now, I have to make a confession because I just spent the last 15 months running for governor in Massachusetts, oh. and I lost. So I can tell you that the first thing that you have to do to be an education governor is win. Yeah. So <laughs> hats off. Hats off to everybody oh, who's here. But it's great to run. It is great to run. It is great to run. But so that's, so I actually want to start there, start there with that question about winning the governorship when you care about education and the role that a leader has in putting values on the table for public conversation. So I'd like to invite each of our panelists to start by sharing something about your role as governor when you were leading in the space of education. What values were you really trying to put front and center? And if there's a story where you really you know, feel like you got that right, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, there are so many because we were talking earlier not only workforce, but just the care in your heart for the children of your state. It's got to be in your heart. It, it, you can't teach someone how to care. You can, you can encourage them, maybe the light will come on and they'll think, you know, I had other issues I was working with and public education was not exactly one of them, but now that I heard you talk about it, and, and Bob and I, we, we're, we're going to go out and disciple to as many of these new governors and current governors as we can. Th this is the true nonpartisan issue for every governor out there. Yep. It is about the future of America, the future of these children. And when I walk into a classroom, particularly when they're small children, and you see their faces, or when you see the students that were on um, the panel this afternoon, it just touches your heart. You, you, you just can't talk about it for a moment. You just want to tell people, look, we, and we can help do that. We can help encourage those type of opportunities into the future. Now, one of the reasons it's hard to be an education governor is because it's hard. It is difficult. There are so many moving parts, and, and we brought in Dr. Lori Smith, who's here, who headed my education uh, in, in, in the entire eight years, and we brought in the State Chamber of Commerce and IHL, Institutes of Higher Learning, and everybody that played a part and said, we want you to know this is our number one issue. We're going to talk about it every day. We're going to move it every day. We're going to invest funds in it every day, and we're going to call on you to be a part of it. So it takes... Right. Um, the entire state. Great. Thank you so much, Governor. I love, love the, the point about the, the children are in your heart and it takes the entire state and you're carrying yep. the message every single day, day after day after day. You are the message carrier. Uh, Governor Wise, how about you? So I want to say ditto to Governor Bryant and I also <laughs> want to say thank you to Chancellor Sarah Tucker of the Higher Education Policy Commission of West Virginia who earlier talked about the importance of education certainly to West Virginia. So I'm going to talk about why I think it's important to be an education governor today. Because an education governor today isn't what I was necessarily 20 years ago. Any governor whose last campaign was pre-Twitter, you've got to be careful of that. <laughs> um, and what, what do I mean by that? Because the work that I've been doing to develop in, in partnership with the Hunt Institute, the work that we've been doing is to show that they're coming out of COVID, we have a public that has just come through the single greatest shared experience since World War II where in most cases children will lock down anywhere from two, two weeks to almost two years, where teachers are under stress. We have not been this shared, we've not had this kind of shared experience in a long, long time. That it joined with the fact that we have, so you have a, what we call the COVID constituency, and when you poll and survey, and we've done a bunch of it, which every candidate has to pay attention to, what we show is there is an incredible public movement building that wants improvements in education pre-COVID. Yes, they want to go back to normal. They want a new normal. 
They want, they want personalized learning because their children have particular needs. There is an emphasis on mental health that was never there before. And there is technology access. There is workforce. Uh, it just goes off the charts on relevance and workforce. What is the point is, you have, for education governor, you can do what Ronald Reagan did so well. You can tap into a sentiment that is already developing and, and speak to it. So my advice to an education governor is don't talk about what you might have spoken in 2019. Talk about 2022. Talk about the shared experience. And, uh, and I'm, hopefully we're going to get into some policy mm -hmm. recommendations. But also talk about what it is that uh, this shared experience that you as a candidate, as a governor, as a human being had, mm -hmm. and relate it to everyone else that's there. If you, once again, I'm so frustrated with hearing speeches today that could have been given in 2019. This COVID swept the slate clean. It changed a lot of perceptions, it changed a lot of needs. And so it, being an education governor today is, uh, to me, is about communicating what it is that's possible and what it is we can do. All right, so Governor Wise, I'm hearing from you that the values that we're putting front and center is we're gonna listen with open ears, look with fresh eyes, and see this moment for what it is. And be real clear about all the different needs that are out there and be ready to do new things. Am and I take one other, right? and one other mess. Yes, but you're good. Uh, <laughs> I'm voting for you the next time. <laughs> but, all right. But, but, but the other part of it is somebody asked just a few minutes ago about the vision in education. This is an opportunity for the education governor to say, let's figure ways we can work together on the problems that have come out of COVID and how right. we rebuild and restore our schools, not focusing on what divides us. And trust me, the survey data, the polling, the focus groups, all says folks want a nonpartisan approach, just like Governor Bryan said. Mm -hmm. They want a nonpartisan approach. Right. They're not Republicans. They're not Democrats on this. They, they're nonpartisan, but it's, it, particularly when it's about their children. Working together, human connection. Yeah. Thank you for those values, putting those on the table. Lieutenant Governor, you have a campaign coming up 2023, so you are thinking about the values that you're leaning into and the message you're going to carry. What are those top values that you want everybody to be thinking about? Well, thank you, and thank you so much for having me. This is an honor to be here um, with these two former governors. Uh, and let me just say, in Kentucky right now, um, it is under duress again. We had historic flooding last night in eastern Kentucky where there are the, there's a, a death toll that's climbing today. So luckily, gov the governor's on the ground. I will be there as soon as I get home. Uh, but please keep um, our friends in eastern Kentucky in your, in your prayers uh, tonight. Um, that being said, um, I am really fortunate to serve in the role of Lieutenant Governor, and I was chosen to run with uh, Governor Andy Bashir. In Kentucky, you run as a ticket, so it's interesting. My seat is the only seat that you have to be asked to run for, right? Um, and I was asked to run with him because I was a teacher. I was a high school teacher, basketball coach, assistant principal uh, my entire career. And so everything I look at it, 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 from this office is through the lens of education because education determines our future. And um, Governor Andy Bashir has been a, an amazing education governor. Um, I say that because he listens to me when I tell him why he needs, no, I'm kidding. Um, but I will tell you this, he's the most popular Democratic governor in the entire country. And he is because he treats every Kentucky family like it's his own. When you've got to make the tough decisions, uh, when, you've got to, when you've got to look at situations and put yourself in other people's shoes and understand how to empathize and sympathize and feel for folks, right, and to help folks, um, that's, that's what leads us. We call it Team Kentucky. We're all on the same team, and we're all trying to help lift up um, every kid in every zip code, no matter their circumstances. We want to make sure every kid has an opportunity. Uh, that, they, that they deserve, regardless of, of where they're from or um, what their parents did for a living. And uh, that has really guided us, not just in education, but in every facet um, of Kentucky. If you think of health care, you think of the workforce, those types of things, it's truly about creating opportunity. And um, I always say this, um, the future of our economy is in our classrooms today, which means not just that the students are our future workforce, it also means that our teachers are our original job creators. Yes. And we have to make sure that both of those ends of the spectrum are supported and they have what they need to be able to do what we need them to do in the future. So I love the... Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Team Great. Kentucky, 
Yeah. Holding every Kentucky family in your heart as your family. Now there's an important message there too because in our families, we do exactly what we were hearing about on the panel with the students, right? When the students were talking about the different kinds of needs that a student has, that a learner has going through school. And sometimes they're health needs and sometimes they're economic needs. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they're just needs about like getting my tech worked out because like my Wi-Fi is not working yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And a family is thinking about the whole child, right? All mm -hmm. those different pieces. And so if you're taking that commitment that everybody's we're thinking of areas my family, you're taking that whole picture commitment mm -hmm. too. That's tough, right? Because that, that brings in the question, we'll switch to policy now. Mm -hmm. Governors are responsible across these different domains of health and economic development and labor and workforce and education. And what we've heard today is so much about the, how these things connect mm -hmm. to each mm -hmm. other. So I've got two mm -hmm. policy questions okay. for each of you. We'll come the other way down the all line right. this time if that's all right. Yeah. One of them is, there is so much money that has just flowed into states for education, and we are hearing so much about how people are having trouble spending it effectively. So how do governors get their hands around that problem and make sure we get it right? That's question one of this. And then the other prong is, how do we help our agencies work together on behalf of our education goals? So that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but I, I will say this, uh, it, and some of the it, some of the uh, funds that have come from the federal government into states. First of all, it was desperately needed, and we are grateful for the opportunity that has created for us to be able to address the issues that, in in my opinion, have always lied just beneath the surface. But COVID, um, while it created its own set of challenges, really magnified old ones. Right, the digital divide is not new. The lack of equity is not new, but it, it, made it, it made us have to come to a point where we say, okay, we're going to take this on head on. And so that's what we really try to do in Kentucky. So I can give you an example, um, uh, the GEAR funding that came down. So that was the governor's discretionary funding. Um, when when uh, the governor and I met about that and he said, what do we need to do with this? Um, and I said, well, I'll be honest with you. We were getting a lot of uh, dollars flowing into Kentucky for um, curriculum and instruction and teaching and learning and, um, uh, you know, the famous, infamous, I think, phrase of learning loss um, and, and all of those things. But I'm worried about our kids, right? Like, not just what their grades are or what their transcript looks like, but are they okay? Uh, and so we actually took every single penny from the governor's discretionary fund, uh, the GEAR funding, and applied it to what we called the whole child, right? And so we provided services around mental health, around um, workforce supports for families, childcare. Um, we also worked uh, to bridge the gap because, and, you know, I think about this as a teacher, yes, a lot of students were at home during, co during the pandemic. The ones, that had, the ones that had before the pandemic we're probably going to be okay. Their parents were going to make sure they filled out those job, those uh, college applications. They were going to do all those things. The kids that didn't have were the ones that really missed out on the opportunity to sit face to face with a guidance counselor and plan their future. So we worked with our um, our folks in higher ed. Our president of higher ed is here, and he spoke a little bit earlier, Aaron Thompson. And we created a, a summer bridge program specifically targeting the students who needed it the most, uh, the students who we knew we wanted to get across that bridge into higher education and provide them supp the support to stay there. And so all of those wraparound services that we provided from all the way from early childhood, or sorry, child care for our earliest learners, mm -hmm. uh, up through bridging the gap for the students that we have that are in the most need, were the ways that we, I think, most effectively spent those dollars in Kentucky. Great. And I forgot your second question. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll pick it up. It was okay. not really fair to ask okay. you to do it once, <laughs> governor-wise. So I'm going to give you a short answer if you elected governor. Call the National Governors Association Center of Best Practices, and they'll give you the best comparison of what other states are doing. That's my short answer. Mm -hmm. You're not getting away with that short, though. Um, <laughs> that is true. So recognize the opportunity that is here, and, and the lieutenant governor just spoke about this. You have the three Cs. You've got incredible crisis, COVID, uh, that has uprooted, decimated, exacerbated, accelerated, uh, all the problems and challenges in education. So you've got crisis. You've got consensus. I, I've 
urge you to look at the uh, COVID constituency work that we've done. You have a public that's willing to support bold action because for the first time, shared experience about their children. It's not me worried about your child's right. mental health anymore. My child's mental health is on the line. Right. So all of a sudden, whole discussion changed. So crisis, consensus, and as the Lieutenant Governor says, you got cash. And that's most of the thing that the public doesn't understand. They don't understand about, nor should they. Why do they work ARP, ESSER dollars for K-12, 122 billion for education. I think it's around 100 million billion or so for higher ed. But don't also, but don't forget the state and local relief dollars that every county, city has gotten in, in municipality. That's $350 billion with incredible flexibility that can be rolled and used to support education, workforce development, mental health, and so on. So this is, this is a unique moment for a, a real leader. It's crisis, consensus, cash, and you won't, you got a limited time. you got about two years to take advantage of it. So if you want to really be an effective governor and leader, and the governor is the ultimate connector in a state. Everyone has a, a microphone. Everyone has a bully pulpit. The governor has the ultimate microphone and bully pulpit. This is a time to take advantage of, of those three Cs. I'm going to ask you to just follow up one little thing, pardon yep. me, Governor, just on that last point about the Governor being the connector, the main connector um, in the state, because that comes up to my second question, which is about the getting the agencies to work together in support yeah. of that yeah. local effort. Do you have any sort of secrets to success for really, you know, breaking down those bureaucratic silos and so yeah, forth? Yeah, oh. <laughs> I'm just mad to say, uh, I, I, I have say to show laugh up. because I, I always say there's two things in government that bureaucrats always tell you. One, we're already doing that, yep. and they're not, or we can't ever do that. You got to get over both of those. Fortunately, the governor in Mississippi gets to appoint a lot of these department heads, like economic development. So you can call him in and say, if you work for me, economic development includes education. Right. So you go tell that to every chamber around the state of Mississippi. Number one educator in the state of Mississippi is good education. So you, you can help do that with boards, yeah. people that you're appointing to the IHL board. Before you appoint them, you say, you understand how important this job is. I'm appointing you to IHL, I'm appointing you to the State Board of Education. And we're just not there to take up space. We have got to move with a sense of urgency. If you've got an agenda as a governor that you've put together, then you always need funding. So see, I wanted an agenda and I said, one of these days, if I ever get $200 million dropped in, I know where I'm going to put it. So we're going to put it in early childhood learning, in a literacy program, $15 million a year in reading coaches. We went from the worst to the, the state and the nation now that leads in reading growth. In 19, in NAEP scores, Mississippi was the number one state in reading growth. Now, now just imagine that, and, and we were the worst at it uh, about a decade ago. So if it happened in Mississippi, it can happen anywhere. But when you've got that agenda, as they, these governors will, all you have to do then is go to your legislature and say, I'm glad you have all these resources. You know what my agenda is. You know where we need the money, school safety. Yeah, so let's put some money into those schools to make them safe. First thing we've got to do is make sure we can protect you. Uh, put them into uh, retraining some of the teachers. We retrained every teacher from K through the third grade because we had some old curriculums that were like 25 years old and they just don't work as well anymore. Put them into technology so you've got um, that Wi-Fi when you're sitting in school and, and you're in rural Mississippi where I live. So yeah, I, I had an agenda. All I needed was the money. Yes, Lieutenant. So I, I, I hate that I forgot your second question because I have a great okay. answer for it. Um, <laughs> but thank you for reminding me. So uh, one of the things that we really tried to do when, when we were elected, first of all, the governor appointed me as the Secretary of Education and Workforce Development. And I served in that role as a cabinet secretary and lieutenant governor um, for the first part of our administration. When we, when we filed to run for re-election, I said, okay, something's got to go. So I did step down from that role. But I will say this, one of the greatest things I think we were able to accomplish is creating the mindset of a cradle to career education and job training system. This is not, well, that is pre-K's problem. That's higher ed's problem. K-12 is a whole, you know, beast of its own, right? Um, and we were all operating kind of in the same area, but not, not really humming the same tune. And so President Thompson, uh, myself, and our commissioner, Jason Glass, uh, came together, and we said, we're going we're gonna to shatter these silos. We're going we're gonna to stop talking, you know, fighting for dollars, in the, you know, independently or just, you know, worrying about our little section of the world because that's not how it works. <laughs> 
Um, and so we created what we called the Commonwealth Education Continuum. I, we did a press conference on it, and I thought to myself, I don't know why we're doing a press conference on this. Nobody's going to care. Boy, was I wrong. We had people <laughs> lined up out the door to be teachers, to be part of our work groups, to tackle the issues from mm -hmm. pre-K all the way through higher education. And so we decided to focus on three areas. T together, we focused on our, our working groups on a dual credit early college emphasis to help our students get started um, so they know what's possible and so that they get a little bit of, a, of an, an advantage and a head start before they leave high school. Uh, we also worked on uh, transition readiness, right? So getting our students to the point where um, whatever their next step in is life in life is once they walk across that stage at graduation, they're ready for it. My job was to improve um, teacher recruitment and retention. That was, that was our area. And as secretary, I invested $1 million in, a, in the project of diversifying our teacher workforce. And so we were able to, for the first time, I think in a long time, bring all of those folks together and say, these are our three main goals. We're going to work together to accomplish them. And we got a whole lot of stuff done because we brought teachers uh, to the table. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That's a great answer to my second question. Mm -hmm. And you have all together really laid out an important theme, right? So we started with the values and the bully pulpit and the message. And then you made the point that the governor is the connector and the governor is the team builder. That's the story you told. Right. All the people right. that you put in different places. And then the lieutenant governor, you added in the importance of getting to the place where people are all singing the same tune. And that was a beautiful story you shared about your press conference. You didn't expect anybody, but they came. What does that mean? There is a sense of urgency, yes. powerful sense of urgency here, and a desire to help. That's a beautiful part of your story. Yeah. People are ready to pitch in. Yeah. And yeah. so the fact that you involved exactly. educators, involved stakeholders to pitch in, we've got to ask ourselves, ask everybody to pitch in. So I love the way together that you've, you've showed us these pieces of what the work of the governor is, the, the leader is. We were calculating in our, our conversation before the panel, we think there are about, I think, 36 seats that are up this November. So it's a really big moment. It is a moment where we have the chance to really set an agenda for education in the country because it is the governors. It is the governors who have the job of building the foundation for education across the country at the end of the day. We need the federal government for help, yes, but state level is where the education authority fundamentally resides. So you've each got a minute, okay, to tell this community what's the strategy for making sure that when those governors step into office in January, they will be a team across party lines pulling for our kids. One minute. Yeah, I think Give it's going to take answer. work from us. It's going to take work from the Reagan Foundation, from the Hunt Foundation, JAG. I, I started to say if you're worried about how to best invest your money, just put it all in JAG. <laughs> and it'll all work out. Dr. Coleman was up here on the stand earlier, Kia, and she would tell you. But, yeah, we have got to do our job. I talked to the Walton Foundation earlier. Every organization that's in this room, and we saw some photographs earlier, has to go to their governors and say, this is important. And when they get to the national governor's meeting, hopefully Kentucky's governor will say, well, I heard that from Mississippi's governor. And Mississippi's governor will say, well, I heard that from Arkansas and, and Colorado's governor. And we all heard that. We better do something about it. And then there's a competition that starts. We'll see who wants to be the best education governor. How about that? There you go. That's yeah. right. There you so go. Competition's healthy. All right. So we need a new panel title for next year, okay? okay. For starters, that's, that's one, right. one takeaway. Yeah. Recognize that this is a moment that is unlike any we've seen before, and we're not going to see again. It, it, unfortunately, going, COVID has been a natural disaster of that has gone on for two and a half years. That means triage, we're coming out of triage. We have to go into, we're in a transition stage right now. And the key is, do you plan for transformation? Just as the Lieutenant Governor is gonna be helping people immediately with triage and then helping do immediate housing and food, but then how do you put people back? And Governor, we, my prayers and thoughts are with you because we share the same border right. and the same Thank flooding you. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But the key then is nobody wants to be put back in exactly the same situation they were. So how do we, call upon the public, how do we draw upon the will that the public's clearly expressing to truly make a difference. That's, the, that's where a governor is a true leader uh, in this. Thank you. So the, the challenges we all face are, are very similar, um, if not identical. 
and they're very complex, but I like to keep the solutions very simple. And so um, if, if you get a chance to talk to your governor and you want to talk to them about how they can help education, here's three simple ways. When they look at policy, you ask, does it put kid, kids first? If it doesn't, pitch it. Second, uh, does it support the people who support our kids every day? They need us too. They cannot do this job alone. We have to be part of the village. And last but not least, and this is rocket science, so make sure you get this, <laughs> we have to provide the resources so that they can do what we've asked them to do. Quit with the unfunded mandates. Put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a very powerful set of strategies. We go across the <laughs> So just to wrap up on that, next year the RISE Summit should have a panel on how to be the best education the best? governor. Right. Sign right. me up. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. and we also will make sure that we are communicating that the time is pressing, the window is short. Yes. This is a moment where we've had a crisis. We've got consensus about our sense of urgency. We've got cash. And now it is time to deliver for our kids. It's not a yes. C, but it sounds a C C kids. It's a good after cash, cash kids. There we go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then the last point, those three simple points that it's gotta put kids first, gotta support the people who are supporting the kids, and you've got to deliver the resources. Your stories have said two things about resources. The cash matters, the funding for mandates matters. But I also heard a lot about the resource of creativity mm -hmm. and collaboration mm -hmm. and connectivity. And we should name that as a resource, yeah. too. Yeah. Part of what we can bring to bear to do this important work together. So thank you so much for being thank with us. You. Thank you.